Hello everyone, today is Thursday, August 27, 2020, and this is the week in charts. I'm sure I thank all you guys and girls for attending. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. I know there's a lot of places you could be or have to be. All right, what are we talk about? Well, I want to talk about current market conditions, obviously. Your questions on trading, your favorite stock picks, if you don't mind, hold up until we get to the live charts for that, and I'll let you know when that is, and you'll see the charts are moving. And then also ask about your stocks one pick at a time. Got a little breeze in here. It must be from the hurricane. Now, what are we going to focus on? Well, I want to talk about the wisdom of Darvis. I've been talking about Darvis on and off for a while. If you've been around, I kind of get on these kicks. <laughs> I kind of get stuck to him for a while. My wife thinks I'm a little bit on the spectrum, and I probably am. <laughs> and But tonight I want to focus not so much on his methodology, but I want to touch upon that again and, and when it can work and maybe some tweaks we could possibly use with it. But more importantly, how he learned to think outside of the box. And I started putting this together, and I realized that this will not fit into one or maybe even several presentations. So there's lots going on. There, and the more I discover about Darvis, it's kind of like peeling the onion. It's just there's a lot more you learn in the process. I wouldn't say a little more, but in some ways, there's a lot of things that that uh, can be unearthed, and we'll cover a lot of that tonight. I also want to talk about Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies possibly being the next big thing. Now, I might have jinxed them last week because so far, They've continued to pull back, but we're going to get to that towards the end of the show or towards the end of the slides, and then we will go into the live charts if need be. There's a claim screen. As you know, you can lose money trading or as often summing up all predictions or about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. And I stole that from my buddy Greg Morris. So Nicholas Darvis wrote a book. In I guess the early 60s or late, late 50s, called How I Made $2 Million in the Stock Market. And the title sounds pretty cheesy, but it's it's not a get rich quick scheme. And basically he figured out these little boxes, and the box top was a high that wasn't touched, in his words, for three days, or a bottom that wasn't touched for three days for the box bottom. And he noticed that these boxes tend to stack up on top of each other. Now, he did write another book, and I found out tonight he wrote a third book, which I'll have more to say about that once I get the book and read it. But he wrote another book called Wall Street to the Las Vegas. This isn't a fantastic book compared to how I made two million. But what I like about it is it does give you a little insight to Darvis and it gives you a little bit more of the behavioral science that he learned about by accident, a little bit more of the trading psychology. And as I flesh some of these things out, these Darvis lessons in upcoming webinars, I'm gonna probably draw upon this book and we'll see what the third book has to offer too. Now, to those of you who don't know, and I know I've been talking a lot about Darvis lately, but just to get everybody up to speed, Darvis was a dancer and he danced around the world. And he had a gig, long story endless, he had a gig in Canada and he agreed to take the gig and he agreed to take stock in lieu of payment for his gig. But then he realized it conflicted with another gig. And so he told the people, the Smith brothers, he said, hey, I tell you what, I can't make that gig, but being a forthright gentleman, I am going to pay you for that stock if you guarantee me the stock will not go down below my purchase price. I'll make up for those losses, I should say. Well, anybody would take that deal. They said, well, I'll tell you what, Darvis, what if we covered your losses for up to six months and then after that, you're on your own? He said, deal. So this gave him the bug to start trading stocks because he went a few months and he had forgotten about the stock or all but forgotten about it. And he looked it up in the paper one day and he saw he had like a $6,000 profit. And he's like, man, how long has this gig been going on? This trading thing sounds pretty easy. Well, then 
he began learning fairly quickly that it wasn't. Now, I just want to talk briefly about his methodology because we've been talking about this quite a bit. And tonight I want to focus more on his psychology and his philosophy that he learned the hard way. And I think we all learn the hard way when it comes to markets. I can preach it till I'm blue in the face, but until you get out there and make your own mistakes. I mean, shoot, I made my own mistakes today. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like, oh, I got a webinar tonight. Great. <laughs> But the thing to remember about breakouts is breakouts work when markets are breaking out and following through. And last week I showed this example, and this is one I'm actually long, but you see you got a high in here, one, two, three days. And after that third day of the high being untouched, so to speak, or three highs less than a prior high, previous high, that defines the top of the box. So Darvis would have bought on this breakout an eighth above and an eighth below. And I'm actually old enough to remember when stocks traded in eighths. And I'm sure judging from your Facebook photos, people in my Facebook group, so are you, <laughs> some of you at least. But anyway, an eighth above the box, an eighth below the box. So in a lot of cases, he would have got stopped out. Now, what's unclear is would he have gone back in when it went through the box again? Or would he have waited for a new box to be drawn like I have here? And you can see the second to last bar would have been another entry. There's a few things that are unclear, and there's a couple of discrepancies. I just want to get these out of the way quickly because I think his wisdom is much more important. But there are a few caveats. Now, breakouts work in markets that are breaking out and following through. More often than not, you will fail at, as a breakout trade. And I'm going through this pretty quickly because I covered it in the stock chart show in the prior weeks. And even Darvis admitted that he expects to be wrong about 50% of the time. And I would say in this day and age, somebody's like, well, just think if Darvis had today's technology. I saw that one of the blogs. It's like, well, everybody has today's technology. So Darvis would have no advantage. His advantage was he was in the land of the blind and he had one eye. So I would, I would say as a rough estimate, 80 to 90% of his trades would have stopped out. But you know, every now and then he might have caught a, a really good one. And, and I've met a few breakout traders in my travels and they are wrong such an unbelievable amount of time. It's just, I can't believe that they're able to just keep trading like that. But every now and then they knock it out the park. Now he was at the right place at the right time. And if you go back to the 50s, and I have a few charts I'll show you. And it sounds like a lot of his trading was done in 57. And then to his credit, he was stopped out of all his positions and nothing new triggered for a long time during that bear market, if you want to call it that, in 58. And it, it sort of reminds me not to be smug because I get my ass handed to me a lot. I got my ass handed to me today. But in 2007, I do remember late 2007, October or so, I couldn't find a long to save my life, even though the market was making new highs. And I actually apologized to my clients. I know I've said that story a thousand times, but it made sense when I read that Darvis stopped out of his stocks and had nothing to do for a while during the bear market. And I was the same way in 2007, long before the real bear market came along. Now, when they come along a little bit more quickly, you get stopped out more quickly and it's a lot more painful as opposed to getting stopped out over a period of time like we did in 2007. So obviously 2020, it happened and it was a little bit more painful. But I did do presentations on that. So if you go in and watch, there is an ebb and flow without digressing too far. You start exiting your longs as you get stopped out and you start putting on some shorts. The crux of his money was made from 1958 on. And you could see there the big blue arrow obviously points higher. Now, he did have a system, but every now and then he did things arbitrarily, like he said, a 10% stop. Well, at first he talked about an eighth above, an eighth below. And in some cases, he would, exited, he would exit a perfectly good stock to raise capital to buy another. And in some of those cases, based on the, the charts that they give in the book, which are a little hard to follow, and, I, and those, I don't know where you can still find these stocks. I think that uh, I'll have to check with the American Association of 
professional technical analyst because we did have a gentleman there. His name escapes me. It's always hard to remember names when you're doing a presentation, but he does maintain these historical database, so, databases. So I need to see if he has the charts. But anyway, there's some inconsistencies. Like he talked about the fact that he got slapped twice by a stock. You know, shame on me, shame. What's the old saying? Screw me once, shame on me, screw me twice, shame on you. So after two times, he figured, no, oh, I wouldn't, I'll never touch a stock again, the same stock again, because it it its personality didn't fit his trading. And he went on to say that maybe its personality fits somebody else. Well, two and a half pages later, or a page and a half later in the books, he, he talked about getting in this big old winner, and the third time was a charm after getting stopped out twice. Now, he did have a money management plan in that he would use a tight stop to begin with, but not much else. And a lot of times he would have two times his account, as much leverage as you can get into one stock. So the book could have easily been how I made and lost $2 million in the stock market. Because if one of those stocks where he had twice his account leveraged up would have halved or more overnight, I mean, think about, I know it's kind of an extreme example. What's that stupid Chinese stock, LK? You know, lost 90% of its value overnight. If you're in a bigger cap stock, that's not likely to happen. But as Nicholas Tlaib would say, just because it hasn't happened doesn't mean it can happen. Just because you've never seen a black swan, which every now and then one would fly in. We're not used to live out in the country, believe it or not. I have some pictures of those. Anyway doesn't mean they don't exist and i know for a fact they exist and i've i've had several stories that are two drink minimums about black swans the other thing he could have done was possibly sell down to sleeping level in one case he had a stock where he had profits of two hundred thousand dollars overnight and he couldn't decide whether to get out in a secondary market he it was the otc market where you can get out in the over-the-counter market so he went out drinking and then he decided to hold on. Well, you could always sell down to the sleeping level. So I just want to get a few criticisms aside. Breakouts work when markets are breaking out and following through. And when they're not, they don't. But he backed into a lot of wisdom. He went into a trading journey, a trader's journey, just like I think every one of us do. And that's the thing about this book is you, you read it when you're a novice. And you don't really catch how much is really there. And I, as you read it and reread it, and I probably think I'm on my sixth read of it. I read it again twice while I was working on some of these presentations that I've been doing lately. But there's a much there's much more to it than a simple little boxes, although his boxes do have some uses, which we'll explore a little bit tonight. So most of what he backed into had a lot to do with trading psychology. And he also learned a lot about how markets work. Now, again, breakouts work in markets that break out and tend to follow through. I am a pullback player, but I do play breakouts in IPOs. So I think you could probably apply something Darvis like to IPOs. So as I often say, I will never show you something here. Well, I'll never say never, but my goal is if I show you a stock, either I recommended it, it was on my watch list, and I personally traded it, or we talked about it in the Facebook group. One of those three things, and sometimes all of those three things. So the stock is VERX. Just want to show you that we did have a lively conversation over in the Facebook group. And applying Darvis's box, the stock comes public. Day one did not touch the first day of trading high. Day two did not touch using Darvis's words, the first day of trading high and day three didn't touch it. So that would be the top of your box. The bottom of your box isn't actually defined yet, but once the stock trades for a little while, three days where that load end get taken out, the bottom of your box is defined. So that's what the box would look like for V-E-R-X. Now it broke out of the box. So Darvis would have bought right when it broke it, broke out of the box. And I actually bought on the close. And there's my trade right there. And this account, I think, is close to 100K. And I like to show this one just because it's able to show you kind of a model type account as to what would happen. 
And you could see that not a whole lot happened with the stock, but as of today, it's it's up nicely. And I'm trying and hoping, I know you should never use the word hope in this business, but hoping we can hit 30 or so so I could take some profits off. Now, this is what it looks like intraday. And you could see that he would have gotten in and the market did back and fill a little bit toward his entry. So we'll have to look at the exact math. If we're using one eighth, he may have survived that. But in many cases, more often than not, I can almost assure you that when you're buying on an intraday breakout, it'll come right back in. Now, the buy at B is a little bit more of a sure thing. And I hate to even use the word sure thing in this business because I'm underwater along for a lot in the buy at B pattern. But sometimes, as I've talked about in the last couple of presentations, sometimes I'll get filled and then maybe it's only one I can think of recently, but there's been a few. And after hours trading, it's up several points, and I don't look a gift horse in the mouth, and I start exiting those shares. But the, pro the point is, with backing and filling, as you can see, quite a bit of backing and filling in this issue on a five-minute chart, more than likely, he probably would have gotten stopped out on that trade. So the one point I'm trying to make, in addition to the fact that breakouts don't work that well, but if you are going to trade them, trade them in a market that is prone to break out and follow through, like IPOs. And then maybe adjust your parameters a little bit, maybe give it a point below that box or even more as opposed to an eighth of a point, which would be about 13 cents. Now, when stocks follow through, the boxes are pretty cool. And this is the biggest winner we have right now in the portfolio. And you can see that, let me back this out a little bit. You can see that it's not perfect Darvis boxes because they're inter they intersect. Ideally, they should make pyramids on top of pyramids, but you can see it has begun to make boxes on top of boxes. And by the way, this thing, this whole thing got started when one of you guys called me and we were talking about Docu, and it, luckily it did have a TKO, which would have gotten you into the trend, and then it turned into a box stock. And if you could figure out what stocks would turn into box stocks ahead of time, you would own the world. And right now, I think Chewy appears to be a box stock, especially when it went up and then consolidated for quite a while, broke out again, and now it's consolidating again. So here comes that word, hopefully, but hopefully it'll continue to consolidate and move forward. And by the way, we're going to talk a little bit about this in one second, but Darvis, and it's actually helped me to kind of relax a little bit. He said that he was okay with the stock bouncing around in his range and it was actually healthy for the stock to bounce around within the box okay its range within the box meaning that it went from the top to bottom top to bottom top to bottom and at one point he said that it if a stock goes down to the bottom of its box it's almost like it's crouching to take over and you'll notice in some cases you could see where the stock goes down to the bottom of the box although in this case it would have taken out the low and then takes off and then it goes to the bottom, back to the top, bottom, and then takes off again and breaks out. So he calls that a dancer crouching. Hey, by the way, not to, to give you too much of a spoiler alert, but this is something I'll probably talk a little bit about or a lot about next week, and I'm guilty of this as anyone, is be as close to the markets as you need to be, but no closer. So Jesse Livermore had a very similar story. Jesse Livermore was in the bucket shops, and a bucket shop means they take your order, they don't actually place your order, but they give you a fill, and then because most of the traders are going to lose anyway, there's no sense giving calling up the big board and getting an actual fill or whatever. And he took a lot of money from the bucket shops to a point where he would have to put on disguises to go to bucket shops, and they would they began to recognize him because he'd be the only one in there making money. Anyway, when Livermore went to New York City, he found out he couldn't make money. Same thing happened with Darvis. Darvis thought, he says, man, I'm flying around the world doing all these dancing gigs. Just think if I didn't have this day job to get in my way how much money I make, I would make. And the reality is he was too close to the market. Tips, caught, got, he got caught up in tips. He got caught up in the zigs and the zags. And some of this will come out in future presentations. So here's another one that we're long. This is the other big winner or okay winner. I wouldn't say it's a huge winner just yet. And if we're looking at the box, as you can see, so far it's made a box somewhat on top another box and it's at the bottom of the box. And by the way, notice that it's also 
pull back to the 30 day EMA. It's a Landry Light pullback. <laughs> because I'm long this stock, I would suggest you go mortgage your house and put all your money into the stock. Obviously, I'm joking, but it does look like it has the potential to head higher. And I actually told my clients tonight if you're long, then now would possibly be a good time to put some shares back on. Remember, for those of you who don't know the methodology, I should say, we get long a stock, we take partial profits, half, we take off half of our position. And that's how I track things in a trading service. But what you can do is occasionally trade, swing trade around that core position and make a little extra money. Now, one thing I've kind of noodled with a little bit, and I've always drawn pivot points in the market, but Darvis boxes can kind of help keep you out of trouble. And a few days ago, if we take a look at the spiders, you can see that they were in a fairly narrow range, tried to break out of the top of their box after a gap, and then tried to break out of the bottom of the box and didn't follow through. And then for the rest of the day, they just chopped and chopped and chopped and chopped and chopped. And finally, at the end of the day, they broke out and kept on going. And I had a couple of failed trades, and then I finally did catch that breakout using some other methodologies in the E-minis. But it can help to keep you out of the trouble. And just like anything, just watch that opening range and make sure you're outside that opening range if you're looking to take an intraday trade. Now, just keep in mind that all methodologies can be balled down to one type of methodology, okay? Or one type of a way to trade, one type of strategy. You're either a trend follower and you're playing like pullbacks or you're a breakout player or you trade reversion to the mean or some combination thereof. And believe me, every methodology has its nuances and mine has quite a few things that I wish I could solve for. And I guess if it's all for them, as I often joke, you'd never see my fat ass again. Now, I think the true lesson in Darvis, I think his boxes are useful, obviously. The trend is your friend and all these other things and breakouts work when markets are breaking out and following through. And as I just said, they might be able to keep you out of a little bit of chop here and there. So they have some use. But I think the real wisdom of Darvis comes from how he went on this trading journey and what he learned in this journey and what we too can also learn and occasionally have to relearn. Now, after he made his initial money by accident, he started trading quite a bit. And he was in and out, in and out, in and out. And he was actually making a little bit of money because, as you'll see in one second, he was in a bull market and didn't realize he was in a bull market. But when he added up all his profits, he noticed he was five or $6,000 in the hole. And that's because commissions were much, much, much higher then than they are now, obviously. In fact, I think I remember when I was trading in the late 80s or early 90s, whenever I got started, the commissions were like 50 bucks a side on a stock. So you had to make like 100 bucks on a stock to break even. So he was in and out, in and out, and he said he jumped in and out of the market like a grasshopper. Well, that sounds like overtrading and watching the screen too much. Now, behavioral scientists have something they call endowment effect. The longer you hold on to something, the harder it is going to be for you to let it go. And Darby said he started to keep pets and talked about them as one talks about their children. Well, that reminds me, I did an article a while back. One of you guys emailed me and said, you were treating your stocks like little children and you didn't want to cut them loose where you should have, whereas you should have been treating them like an employee and fire the bad ones and keep the good ones. And that's one of the first lessons I tell someone new to trading. It's one example I often give is I was a kid in the gym trading a lot of weed stocks and initially he did really well and then he was down about 50% in all of them and he says I can't sell now they're down too much and I said look if you had three guys that were busting their butt and a four and you were their manager and a fourth guy that was sitting on his butt 
would you? And before I could finish a sentence, he goes, I'd fire his ass. And I'm like, exactly. It's like you wouldn't wait for him to start working one day. You would get rid of them. So along the lines of keeping pets, you have to remove your attachment from the stocks. Good stocks go up, if you're long, of course, and bad stocks go down. It also reminds me, it's <laughs> years and years ago, I walked into the gym, I'm all depressed, bummed out, lost a S ton of money. And the reception is like, what's wrong? And I'm like, oh, I lost some money. I'm in a bunch of bad stocks. What's wrong? I'm going to buy some good ones. And I'm like, oh, you stupid. You have no idea. You have no idea what it takes to trade. And evidently she did. <laughs> it's amazing how simple it could be sometimes. In his discovery phase, he was a victim of selective perception and perceptual distortion. We're all guilty of that, okay? You sometimes it's hard to believe in what you see and not in what you believe today for instance i had a couple of positions going against me and every now and then i get a little uptick and i'm like oh okay well it's much better now maybe it's turning around and the reality is i was kind of fooling myself into that so selective perception and its close cousin perceptual distortion are very important and Darvis kind of backed into that too by accident. I was buoyed up and excited by small gains and overlooked my losses. I think we've been there, done that. Got the t-shirt. I think I have a t-shirt today, freshly minted. Trade and liquid issues. When it came time to sell, some stocks stuck to my fingers, fingers like tar. John Ross, who is here tonight, I think he coined the phrase Hotel California. We are big fans of trading IPOs in the group. We talk about that probably as much or more than anything else in the Facebook group. And one day he talked about getting into an IPO and then the volume begins to dry up. And that's the tricky part of trading IPOs. And we talked about that last week, okay? It was John Zinsky, John Z? Okay, it was John Z, okay. I give John Ross credit. I get, I, I get, I, I know you personally, but I get, I get the two mixed up on who said that. Okay, it was, so it was John Z. So John Z called him Hotel California. And sometimes you get in these IPOs, the volume dries up, and then you got a one point or worse, even more spread. And this is something that I think Darvis accidentally backed into too. It's like when it came time to sell, his stock stuck to my finger like tar, like to his fingers like tar. You have to trade a stock that's liquid or not, but if you go overboard with liquidity, unless you're scalping or something, it's harder for those super liquid stocks to make any efficient moves. And that's a conversation for another time. But if you are trading a market that can be illiquid, such as IPO, just make sure you look at enough trading days to make an educated guess that it has enough volume to trade. Now, like all of us, I would venture to say he ended up on a grail hunt. Now, I read on the internet where he read over 200 books. And it's kind of interesting. I'm not sure this would have helped or hurt him, but he was actually an economist or had a degree in economics. So it wasn't like he was a complete, it wasn't like he was completely ignorant to the stock market or, or, or such, but that might have actually hurt him because what he learned in actual trading didn't have a whole lot to do with economics. So that's one thing that, that, it was not obvious in the book that he that he didn't have any financial background whatsoever, but he had he had a little bit if you call if you consider being an economist part of that. I, I have a, an economist joke, but I don't want to offend anybody if there's an economist in here. So I read somewhere in the net where he read over 200 books. In the book, he said he read at least seven, and there's seven that's listed in the book that he read. And I've been working to track those down to see if there's anything worthwhile in those. He, at one point, and I might have a slide on this, but he got to thinking that if you're an inside, if you're an insider of the company, you obviously know what's going on with the company. And if you're buying stock in a company, which you have to report to the SEC and make that public, 
then you probably know most about the company and we should probably follow you. Unfortunately, that makes sense, but they didn't know the attitude of the market. So even if it's the greatest stock in Great Town, if it's going down, nothing's going to stop it from going down. And there's a lot of quotes kind of escape me at the moment. And Livermore has a bunch of good quotes about that. But if the market's going down, it's going down. What school of thought did he subscribe to with regards to economics? He, as you'll see in a second, subscribed to the school of trend following morons. He also chased a lot of hot tips around and learned that you can get burnt doing that. He assumed a broker knows more than he does. And his broker was putting him in and out of stocks, in and out of stocks. And net, net, breaking even, make, maybe making a little bit, but with commissions, losing money. Now, he reached the epiphany and enlightenment phase that I think we all eventually get to. And again, the insiders, they might understand their company, but they didn't know the attitude of the market. The best stocks behaved well. They never gave me a moment's anxiety, so I left them alone. If you think about as a general statement, the stocks in your portfolio that eventually turn into stinkers are ones that were a loser for a long time. Now, I'm not saying get rid of them because every now and then one will take off and because the methodology or my methodology requires the occasional outlier, you need to stick with those stocks until and unless stopped out. But Mr. Darvis does have a point. The best stocks behave well, and he didn't worry about them as long as they were behaving well. And he didn't micromanage himself out of them. Now, he did micromanage here and there, as I said earlier, by exiting one stock to buy another. I'd rather hold onto one rising stock for a longer period than juggle a dozen for a shorter period of time. I have one account where I don't place many intraday trades and I have another account where I'm in and out like a little grasshopper, like you said, sometimes. And uh, I notice that sometimes I'll get chewed up in that active, active account and then I'll look to the less active account and it's just kind of plodding along and in some cases doing really, really well. The chewy, it's tacking on, not, not in a straight line, but a couple of points here and there. And some of these other stocks we've traded in the past, OCFT and, and quite a few others, they just kind of go about their business and they do fairly well. And by leaving the account alone, those stocks are left to just trend. And lately I've been call it, calling the, the intraday trading because of all the excitement with the Robin Hood people out there creating all this volatility and all these little stocks going up 100% or 1,000% overnight. As one client told me, he says, you're chasing a lot of rabbits. We got to talk about markets. And, and as I said recently, I was like, oh, my, my equity curve, my equity just jumped. I don't even know which stock is it caused that. And, you know, it kind of woke me up a little bit. It's like maybe I'm getting sucked into a little bit too much trading. Now, one of his epiphanies, as I often say, is don't confuse the issue with facts. When things look perfectly on paper, the stocks never acted accordingly. What makes sense, what is logical, often does not work in real markets. The map is not the territory. Now, as I often say, and Darvis figured this out too, if you find a stock you like, check for sexy sisters or sexy brothers, whatever you're into. And I guess if you're into both, you're a greedy bastard. <laughs> Groups move like herds, groups being a sector. If you can't make money with a leader, you would not make money with the others. That's a pretty important thing to say. Wouldn't you agree? Technical analysis leads the way. Price movement is all that's needed. Now he did add in some fundamentals at one point. It was a little unclear as to what fundamentals he added in. And here's where the discrepancies come in. It seems like he kind of later tossed those out. And I'm 
I'm working to find some more materials on him to figure out if he truly did add back in and then get rid of the fundamentals. But he did learn early on that price movement is all that's needed. Well, you think about it. How do you make money trading? You need a greater fool. You need somebody to buy that stock or other market away from you at a higher price. Okay. So all that has to happen, I know, easier said than done, is the price has to move in your favor. The stock that saved me from disaster was about which I knew nothing. I picked it for one reason only. It appeared to be rising. Amen, my brother from another mother. Buy stocks that go up. If they don't go up, don't buy them, as Will Rogers once said. And in IPOs, I use Mr. Rogers quite a bit because there's a few caveats and details. But for the most part, if you just bought IPOs that go up, you would do really well and avoid the ones that go down. See last week's presentation on that. Epiphanies and enlightenment. You can't transfer knowledge. You better learn how markets work. Doctors, lawyers, automatic transmission mechanics, as I often preach, and quite a few other professions make for really bad traders because they're highly skilled and highly educated people. And they assume, one, they can apply logic, which you can't because the markets trade on emotions. By the way, my brother-in-law tried his hand at day trading a while back, a few weeks ago. And every time we'd have these family gatherings, he would argue about, oh, well, stock has to make money and do this. It has to be a good company. And my company that I work for is the best company and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, well, you know, uptrend, downtrend, sideways. Markets just trade on emotions. Well, he got in there. He felt the emotions and he watched these stocks go up and down with no rhyme or reason, at least to him. And he realized that, wait a minute, markets do trade on emotions. He was down last week and he says, Dave, I get it now. I've been telling him for 10 years, maybe, well, actually 20 years I've been telling him that markets trade on emotions, but now he gets it. Anyway, you can't transfer knowledge just because you're smart and successful. You can't necessarily transfer that knowledge into trading. You have to get educated. You're going to have to go through a school of hard knocks like Mr. Darvis and like me. And sometimes you have to keep attending that school and go get a few more lessons. But Darvis realized that he couldn't win at bridge without knowing the rules and or he couldn't win a chess game without knowing how to answer his opponent's moves. So in the same way, how could he expect, how could I expect to succeed in the markets without knowing how to trade. I was playing for money and the game in the market was against the keenest expert. Every time I make a trade, I always ask myself, what does the other guy know? Why is he selling me that stock? Am I the greater fool? And a lot of times I am. <laughs> I cannot play against them and expect to win without learning the fundamentals of the game. Not fundamentals, fundamentals, but the fundamentals of the game. Now, another one of his epiphanies was don't confuse brains with a bull market. What I did not know was that I was smack in the middle of the biggest bull market in the world. The biggest bull market the world had ever seen. And it was quite difficult, unless you were extremely unlucky, not to show a little paper, paper profit from time to time. I found myself drawing big blue arrows on the chart. Oh, how, how amazing was that? That Darvis was drawing arrows on the chart. Actually, he didn't say that, I put that in. So this was the period of time he was talking about in 1954 when he was getting his feet wet. And that's sort of, made him think that he knew more than he really did, but then he realized that, hey, unless you're extremely unlucky, anybody could make a little money in that market, right? Now, along the way, he learned that the trend is your friend, and he said that Landry Light and Persistency are your best friends. Okay, he didn't say that, but... I'll show you where I do think those things are very important. Stock movements were not completely haphazard. 
as if attracted by a bag that they had defined upward or downward movement once established tended to continue. So if you look at something like Landry Light for let's say 10 days, then that stock may be trending if it's going up and down, up and down around that moving average. And I'll walk you through that in one minute. Then maybe and likely it's not trending. And persistency is a stock's ability to go up day after day after day. Once a stock gets into a nice trend by Landry Light and then followed by persistency, it'll tend to stay in that trend. Doesn't mean that you could just jump right in. But if you look for a setup, you're going to be much better off than fighting the trend. Now, he did learn to trade in more volatile stocks. And one thing that's kind of interesting is, and I read it in this book and in some other book, I'm trying to remember where, I think it was in not the book that Darvis mentions, the ABC of speculation, but there's one similar to that, the ABCs of speculation or something. It's not the same exact book. But they talked about stocks having a personality, and Darvis kind of backed into this by accident. And if you think about it, the personality of the stocks are based on the personality of people trading it. This, this client slash friend who I talk with a lot, we chit chat every day about trading, He's a big fan of scalping and he used to go in and get several points in Boeing and now he's having a hard time getting a lot of money out of Boeing. Well, the personality has changed because the personality of people trading the stocks, that stock has changed. Probably had a lot of um, bottom fishers from Robin Hood and, and small traders, but a lot of them creating that crazy volatility. So Darby said he would compare stocks with people. If a temptuous beauty were to jump on uh, to a table and do a wild dance, no one would be astonished. But if a dignified matron was suddenly to do the same, this would be unusual and people would immediately say, there is something strange here, something has happened. Well, this might have been a hard example to, to get on to, but take a look at like Kodak recently, sleepy old company just dying out, a slow death over years and years, all of a sudden takes off, something happened, right? So if a stock does begin to move, if a sleepy little stock begins to wake up, then maybe something's going on. It kind of reminds me of the Phoenix type of strategy. We have like an energy stock that just bottoms out for years and years, or it could be any kind of company, just goes sideways forever, bores you to death if you try to look at it. And then all of a sudden it starts breaking out, maybe makes a bow tie or something. The personality of that stock may be changing. He went on to say, if it did not bounce up and down inside the box, I was worried. So like the Chewy bouncing back and forth, that's a good sign. It means there's some interest in the stock. Now, Darvis is a little bit like Livermore, maybe not quite as much, but once you start getting into it, you find a lot, a lot of good information. And again, I think the longer you've been trading, when you go back and read it, you're, you will have some of these aha moments or like, I hear you, brother, on some of these things. So we're going to come back to Darvis quite a bit. And I'll get his third book. It's on its way. So once I get that, we'll see if we could maybe figure out some of the discrepancies in his methodology. But I think at the least, I'm hoping that we'll get a little bit more insight into how he learned these things. Now, last week I talked about crypto being the next big thing, and it was the last big thing. And it's, it's always dangerous because the last big thing is always not the next big thing. But I suppose if you go back to the market crash, we had a really nice downtrend and Bitcoin and all the other cryptos, and now we're in a really nice uptrend. So here's my favorite one right now. I am long this particular market. And you can see down here we have Landry Light. This is the plugin from stockcharts.com, which is free to members of Stock Charts, provided, of course, you like the video down below and you can get the plug in free. 
If you pull up their ACP platform, it'll be down here as a little plug. You just click on that, click on Dave Landry, bam, it's in your browser. So you can see here we had Landry light, meaning the lows are greater than moving average. A little indicator in the bottom, to those who aren't familiar with it, just helps to illustrate, not indicate, but illustrate how long that's been happening. You could see it in the actual chart. You could actually count it if you wanted to, but it's a little simpler. Just look down here and say, okay, we've had almost 40 days where this market has gone up. We had a little kiss of the moving average. This would have been a really nice entry back here. I did not know of this currency. I just traded Bitcoin and Litecoin and Ethereum. Occasionally some Ripple. Might need some Ripple after today. <laughs> and uh, John Z in the group turned me on to this one. I just really didn't pay attention to all these what I've considered lesser currencies, and I'll lose that use that term loosely. But this one's pretty cool. And also, it has a big blue arrow in it. Now, it didn't quite come down and kiss the moving average. It's hard to see because I've got a thick moving average on here. But there's a tiny, tiny, tiny bit of Landry light between the lows. So the count continues to go higher. So just remember that each day the low is above the moving average, the count goes up, 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 up. And then when it intersects the moving average, it goes to zero. And when it dips below, it actually turns red. So in this big old chart, I'm just noticing this as I'm doing this presentation, we had one day of downside Landry light. So I think there's a lot to be fleshed out here. I actually had a money manager to, uh, email me today and he's been playing around with Landry light and as simple as it is, and that's always flattering to me is when someone who knows a lot about markets, maybe more than me, probably more than me, can take something so simple and integrate it into their trading. So I'm very flattered with that. So I think there's something that can be played with for sure. And I think there's something there, but you can see that it pulls back a little bit. And by the way, because this is so simple, and this was first, I first wrote about this in my third book, maybe? Oh no, second book, uh, it, it, Dave Landry's 10 Best Swing Trade Patterns and Strategies. And if you go to www.davelandry slash free book, you can get it for free. And I don't know if there's a hyphen in that or not, but if you're watching the recording of this, I'll put a link in this presentation. Yeah, I know, I'm gonna <laughs> give everything away and make it up in volume, huh? But anyway, Landry Light pullbacks. In the book, I used a 20 EMA lately because of the volatility of the markets. I've been really getting into using a 30-day EMA. I know you wanna party with me, is what you're probably thinking. <laughs> Here's Bitcoin. Bitcoin's not looking as good as the other markets it's lost a little bit of steam but based on the landry light and bitcoin's probably a little bit more efficient than those other other cryptos so i'm not as excited about bitcoin although i am still long some bitcoin as those other ones and what i've been doing a little bit of is is without chasing my own tail is kind of looking at the relative strength not with an indicator but just based on the percentage move and which one which Currency looks better than the other, and we're doing a little rotating into the stronger ones. And I don't want to get to a point where I go crazy with that because I think you can end up chasing your own tail. But as a general statement, you do want to focus on the best of the best. But you can see we've got nice little longer term uptrend here. There's your Landry light, as you can see, lows greater than the moving average for about 40 days almost. And by the way, you could set these bands down here. And we can take a look at live charts with some of these in a minute. And of course, the big blue arrow and a nice little pullback. So that looks pretty good. I like the link a little bit better. A little kiss of the moving average here. I think in the second book, I called it Kiss My Goodbye. It may be the moving average. Now, Ethereum looks a little bit better than Bitcoin. If I had to rate them, of the, the major currencies, and I'm sure there's more currencies I'm leaving out, but I would say Link first, and I don't even know what Link is. Does anybody understand what Link is? I'll have to do some research. I don't think it matters as long as it's tradable, right? The stock that I made most money on was a stock I knew the least about. It just went up. That's what Darvis said, right? Anyway, you can see 
Ethereum, you've had a nice little move higher, nearly 40 days. Uh, Landry Light, as I said earlier, 10 days is probably a pretty good count for a trend, both up and down. The lows are greater than the moving average, as you can see here. The big blue arrow points higher and then it pulls back. So this is a pretty good looking currency too. And there's your little kiss of the moving average. So I think cryptos, although they haven't done much over the last week, I hope I didn't jinx them, but I think cryptos and IPOs, IPOs as a general statement have been doing really well lately. I think those, as we talked about last week, can be the two next big things and they were the last big things too. All right, everybody here I think is in the Facebook group. If you're watching a recording, please join the Facebook group, but you have to be a member of DaveLandry.com. You have to be a, a gold member, and that's to keep the riffraff out. I'm half kidding, but I, I have to say I've been involved with a lot of groups, even, even professional groups, and they could be the worst. Uh, <laughs> It, it's like Lord of the Flies takes over, but uh, God, we've been so blessed with this group. It's just been absolutely amazing, and and I lurk a lot. And, and you guys are like, where's Dave? It's like I'm just lurking because I'm I'm soaking it all in watching you guys. But you can interact with other traders. I mean, if you're a trader, you probably know it can be a lonely sport, and it helps to interact with others. You know, when it has a few minutes ago, I had a bad day. My wife, I don't want to hear about it. You know, it's like so. <laughs> I have no one to talk to about my bad day. <laughs> you can ask for help. And, and as I often say, what amazes me is by the time I get to answering the question, when I look at the other comments, the question has already been answered. Signs and signals, every now and then I'll throw something out there. And a lot of us will talk about IPOs as you saw earlier. And then we could follow along with trades like opening gap reversal. Sometimes I'll throw out some of those. All right, let me shift gears here. Let me get to the live charts. And then we will start looking at your individual stock picks. In fact, if you want me to take a look at individual stocks or some markets like crypto, I'll be happy to do that for you. Let me just start let's start taking a look at the overall market. So just punch your symbols in one at a time, and I'll take a look at those. Let's start with the P's, P500, and that spinning top. And I don't want to show you how little I know about candles. I tried to learn everything and then realized that I ended up chasing my own tail. I had a bad experience. Doesn't mean that you will. Your mileage may vary. I do occasionally, believe it or not, I have to admit, I do occasionally use candles because sometimes it's easier to see more because I've got, a, I got a, some of these templates are left over. So like if I'm looking at intraday stuff, I'll put in a candle chart and all of my think or swim charts, I think are candle charts just by default. But I'm so used to looking at, when I do my scans, I'm so used to looking at the open, high, low, close charts, it would be hard for me to switch over to candles. Now, if I'm trading real markets, the candle charts are fine for that purpose, especially like a five minute chart or something like that. Anyway, as I just said, NASDAQ composite off a smidge, you could use a breather, as you can see, big blue arrow, in this case, cyan, continues to point higher. Again, Russell 2000, just kind of consolidating in here up a smidge today. Recent breakout remains intact. Let's take a look at gold, the commodity, since we're here. Little opening gap reversal. Not so it's a little opening gap reversal there. Longer term uptrend intact. If this was a stock or other market, I might be a little concerned about this big gap here down, but gold and commodities in general can occasionally gap lower like that because they can be an inefficient market and every now and then you have a big gap one way or the other. Gold the stocks, same sort of action, sort of following suit today, along with in lately, I should say, along with the gold stocks. A diddle for ditto for silver. One thing was kind of interesting today is health services has been on a relative strength a little bit stronger than let's say the drugs or biotech within the drugs. But then you could see that today they actually continue to be stronger by breaking out to not quite all-time highs, but they're right at all-time highs. So that's kind of interesting. And that is a sign that the market is healthy, no pun intended. Biotechnology, a little concerned about these guys. I'm kind of a biotech bull. I need to watch myself because 
I can be a bit of a biotech bull. I've always been a biotech bull on and off. But as you can see, this bow tie to the downside, the 10 simple is less than the 20 exponential, and the 20 exponential is less than the 30 exponential. I wouldn't count them down and out just yet. Take a look at like a weekly chart. So far, it just looks like a bit of a healthy pullback, right? You've got the daylight or Landry light, as we now call it. And then you got your 30 EMA on a weekly chart. So that still looks pretty good. So I wouldn't rush out and short biotech. But I would start becoming a little bit more selective in your stock picking there because the overall sector is beginning to obviously lose a little steam. Transports, not a huge fan of transport stocks, but look at that, almost to all-time highs, decent little day here, highest level since the beginning of the year before all this mess got started, up a percent and change, so transport's looking pretty good. And here, most technology-related areas, hardware, or as I call it now, Apple, I think Apple's 90% of the hardware sector. Software, as you can see, longer-term uptrend. Semiconductors, a little bit of a correction today, no big deal. We've got one possible short in the semiconductors, but I told my peeps, most of which are here tonight, don't run out and go short crazy, but if you want to fire for short just to remember how to do it, then by all means, knock yourself out. And if you dig through the semiconductor sector, I'm sure you can figure out what that short is. Anyway, that's pretty much the action in the overall market. Bonds kind of broke down a little bit today, as you can see, kind of wide and loose and all over the place. And then one thing that's kind of interesting is it's no big shocker. The dollar has been in a downtrend. Well, dollar down, stocks up. Something is biting me. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, any individual stock picks you guys want to take a look at? SSSS? Is that a stock oh wow look at that okay closed in fund okay so i'm not a huge fan of closed in funds but it depends on what they're doing if it's if they're buying if they're a uranium closed in fund or whatever then it might be worth a shot now i guess mr darvis would like this stock is there a box in here you know where there's a box? There's a box in the um, there's a box in ACP, and I'll show you how to use that in one second. But you could draw just a some horizontal lines. So right now it's kind of stuck in a box. What I would like to see would be for this stock to break out and then look to play pullbacks along the way. So my entry. Like this was a TKO bar here, a trend knockout. This could have been a little bit bigger. If this would have been a little bit bigger and this pullback a little bit deeper, this may have caught my eye. But yeah, by all means, put that on your momentum list and keep an eye on it, okay? Apps, apps is on my momentum list. And you can see, in fact, let's, let's do something fun here. Let's unflag all in system. Let's go to my momentum list. If I can get there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to highlight all the stocks in the momentum list. Oops. In fact, what we could do for you guys in the Facebook group is I can export this list tomorrow if you guys remind me, and if you want to import it into Telechart, you can do that. So apps, see the little check mark down here? Bam, that's in my momentum list. I'm not a genius or anything, I just go through stocks, and if I see a stock that looks like this, I stick it in my momentum list. So this looks pretty good. John, i like to see a little bit deeper pullback this market doesn't always give you that lately, though, but for a stock that's gone so far, I'd like to see a deeper pullback. And just by chance, and a lot of my stuff is not quantifiable, but just by chance lately, it seems like the 30-day EMA is a good place for the pullback, okay? So, yeah, put that on your momentum list. 
if you get my momentum list, it'll be on it, okay? Does the moves in Apple make any sense for Suman? All right, let's take a look at that. Well, here's the thing. It doesn't have to make sense, okay? Is it going up, is it going down, or is it going sideways? If it's going up, where can you get in? Well, look right here, Suman. We had all this, and I hope I'm saying your name correctly. We had all this Landry light here, which obviously this is a really big trend. It made a, what I call a double top knockout. But if even if you didn't know that pattern, if you knew the Landry light pullback pattern, it pulls back to what? The 30 day EMA, isn't that cool? Triggers and then off to the races. Does the move make sense? Absolutely not, okay? How can they make enough iPhones or whatever they're selling now that's making their most money to justify this? I have no idea, but I don't care. In fact, let me see if I have that list in front of me somewhere. It's on the floor. <laughs> I was making a list of all the stocks that I'm in. I'd be hard pressed to tell you what it, what, what they do. CRDF is kind of boxy. Boxy is the new sexy. Yeah, that's a crazy one. And is it in Big Dave's momentum list? Yeah, look right there. Bam, right there. Yeah, see, that's a great example. This kind of reminds me of uh, OCFT, which is one I was showing as a box, okay? So way back when this thing went public, and luckily I went back and checked my records. I did trade it back here. And hopefully we were talking about in the Facebook group, you know, there's a feature in Facebook where you can search to see if we talked about these stocks, which keeps us all honest. But I did buy it back here and played this breakout, okay? And then I did recommend in the service over here and we caught a really good ride. Unfortunately, it came back in much sooner than I would have hoped. And we did give up a sizable part portion of those open profits. So, now it's lost too much momentum for me to get excited about it, okay? And it's not really that boxy. I mean, the box is kind of, it's kind of like falling boxes now. And just like the boxes stack up to the downside, Darvis said that the boxes also stack down to the downside, okay? Now, I don't think he shorted, but you can kind of use the same theory. So. Just eyeballing this, the boxes are beginning to fall. If we take a look at OCFT, okay, if you just started your technical analysis journey tonight and you're like, hey, you know, that Landry Light thing looks pretty cool. I don't know much about stocks, but I can see that this stock had a lot of Landry light back here. It pulled back to the EMA, a little kiss, took off. Yeah, I, could, I think I could have recognized that pattern. I think I could have traded that. Now, what is it doing, okay? What have you done for me lately, Janet? <laughs> well, now we've got some downside Landry light. Well, I got a little upside here, but it's down, it's up, it's up, it's down, it's up, it's down. It's becoming a Jackie Mason stock. So remember earlier I said we could set the reference level. And by the way, I'm not compensated at all by stock charts, although occasionally somebody finds me through them and I'm happy for that. So it's a little quid pro quo, obviously. But you could see, remember what Darvis said? That once a stock began to trend, it tended to keep trending. It's not always that easy, but look, you get 10 days of Landry light, 10 days right here. You see a little reference line? And let me put this up here for you if I can grab it. I'm kind of new to all this too. Obviously it's brand new, so I'm new to all this too. But here's a little reference light. So 10 days would be like right here. And then it did have a pretty good trend from those 10 days. If you, if all you did was wait for at least 10 days of Landry light like this and a little pullback to moving average, I think you would do pretty good, okay? So let's take a look at the boxes and let's see if I could do this on the fly. And this stuff is still in beta, the boxes that is. So I could eyeball this right here and say, okay, that's a box, right? Because this high was untouched for one, two, three days. That's the top of the box, okay? And then the bottom of the box would be right there. 
Now, here's the next thing. Let me bring this in a little bit. So your first box looks like that, but then what happens is you make a box here, okay? And then you end up, let's see, one, two, three. So now you have a box, if I can get another one to draw. Now you have a box here, okay? And then one, two, three, let's do this. So you did have one little box that rose up a little in here, right here. That one went up a little bit, okay? And now we don't know what's going to happen with this one. But it wasn't as extreme as I thought it might be when I said it had falling boxes. But a little bit, one, two, three, kind of falling boxes, at least the highs of the boxes are falling a little bit, okay? So I think it's, I think it's done for that particular one. CRDF kind of boxy. Let's put that in there and see what you're saying. So yeah, I mean, this was a pretty good looking stock a while back. Oops, I got to turn off my box tool. Do, 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 do clear. I'll tell you I was new to this. But yeah, you know, you're going to be amazed. Don't get too excited though. You're going to be amazed when you go back and look at your charts and say, wow, Look at these stocks. They just pull back to the moving average and take off again. Nice Landry light pullback. I mean, I'm a nerd, but that should get you excited. If that didn't get you, get you excited, I don't know what will. You should get excited about what you could do with the money from trading when you see a pattern like that. How's that? So, yeah, let's see. That's this kind of boxy. Yep, that would have been a box there. And then I see a box here. Let's extend that forward. Yep. Okay. Now where's the box? Well, there's one, there's one right here. And then now where's the box? There's one right there. Okay. This is actually so what did Darvis say? Well, you might not know what he said. But he said he liked to see the boxes stack on top of each other. And the best ones, the boxes don't intersect the prior lows. Okay. So yeah, I see what you're saying. Absolutely. That's a little boxy. Boxy is the new sexy. Jets, BLDR as RTP pullback. Pull, what is RTP? Jets. Jets have been a little choppy in here. Oops, I gotta keep turning. I gotta turn that off. That's a little cumbersome. I can see Jets have gone sideways for quite a while. I mean, it did get you did get a little bit of Landry light in here. But then you also need to look at okay, what's my net net? What's my what's my sideways arrow doing? So I wouldn't get too excited about jets unless it took off, no pun intended, and then pull back to the moving average. And you can see a while back, if you go into service, we didn't fortunately we did not trigger. But a while back when they took off and pulled back, I was actually a bull on the jets, but we we got no follow through. How's that for good English? B L D R. Yeah, that looks fantastic. Um, you know, it kind of broke out today, so it would have triggered if you were playing that, but you almost had that pullback to the moving average. So yeah, that looks good. RTP is another. I'm not sure what you mean by RTP, Laurent. XLV, would you buy the breakout in ETF? XLV is going to be healthcare. No, I'm not a breakout player, but I hear you, okay? And that does look kind of interesting. And it's interesting in that you've had a, a return to paradise. Okay, I got you. It's interesting in that you have nice Landry light for a while, though the momentum, as you can see, is slow because it's going sideways. So don't don't use an indicator in a vacuum. I wouldn't call it return to paradise because it's already at new highs, okay? So return to paradise would be something that oh maybe that's not what he's asking is it yeah return to paradise so thank you chris and thank you lauren so return to paradise would be something that shoots higher comes down consolidates and then takes off again and by the way you could use something like the landry light or whatever to help you find those stocks okay if you wanted some exposure yeah that's fine if you wanted some ex i hear what you're saying okay so let's say you wanted some exposure to healthcare. Yeah, that's fine. You could buy the XLV. 
ideally though when i go for exposure i want somebody's asking about slv that'd be a good example i want to go to a sector that's set up okay so right now silver looks pretty good okay and we had a tko back here and a tko recently triggered and that's why i mentioned it in the pitch last week or maybe back here has it been two weeks it's been a while so that's why i like that particular stock or sector i should say so ideally you want it to be set up too but i hear you if you really want an exposure like back here you just kind of break it out and you don't you can't find any stocks i hear you but just be prepared to have that breakout fail okay bgfv did we talk about that bgfv yeah, this is one that's been on and off the Landry list for a while now. It's got quite a few days of the pullback, okay? But I hear you. It could it could easily pull back and then take off again. You know, and maybe I'm kind of backing into something here. If you were to trade breakouts, maybe a good breakout to trade, and this is why I love to teach because I learn myself, right? But look at what it did back here, okay? So this is really no longer a pullback, although it kind of gapped open, would have been hard to get in. But what if you traded stocks that were in nice uptrends, let's say you had at least 10 to 15 bars of Landry Light, and then they base for a while, then they look to play that short-term breakout out of the base. So that's kind of the action you have here. Maybe play the short-term breakout. It's not one of the patterns I trade, but it might be eventually, and this is how I discover a lot of stuff. But yeah, Carol, SLV still looks pretty good, okay? Commodity-related stocks, I'm a little bit more lenient on. Commodity-related ETFs, but what you might wanna do if you're not already long, look to get long above this little pivot point here. What is the uh, the juniors, SILV, is it SILV? No, that's not it. Anybody know what the junior silver stocks are? I, I stumbled across those the other night by accident, and the stock is going straight up. HZO. Ooh, that looks pretty good. Let me let me just check it back here in my other thing. Oh, yeah, that looks pretty good. Now, the only problem I kind of see with it is it could probably use a little deeper pullback, but it looks pretty good, I have to admit. Let's see, we ran from 13 to 33. This kind of looks a little more flaggish, but yeah, it's got, oh, it's not quite to the 30, which is no big deal. So just when I jump to my blank chart over in Telechart, I kind of like it, but it needs a tiny bit more pullback. But yeah, that's a good looking stock, okay? What's the HV on that? 45, that's pretty good HV. The HV, by the way, in the overall market has begun to implode a little bit, and that's because we're going up in a fairly orderly manner. But yeah, put that in your watch list for sure. RRC is going to be an energy stock, range resources, I believe. Yeah, that looks pretty good. Uh, let me pop over here just for a second. I know you can't see when I do this. Um, yeah, it's not bad. It didn't, you know, here's the thing. It's, a, it's an energy stock, so I'm a little bit more lenient. I would have preferred this breakout here to be above that high a little bit more okay but it's certainly it's certainly okay let's see if we can get a little bit longer term range in range let's get a year today chart see what we're looking at okay let's go a little bit longer yeah it looks okay but see how this peak it's a little more obvious now it really didn't get past that peak so i'd like to see more acceleration high also energy right now is not really setting the world on fire so I'd have to really, really like a setup, but it's not bad, okay? It's certainly not bad. I mean, here's the thing, everybody's getting a lot smarter in these presentations, not smarter, how do I say this? They're getting more wise to what I like, okay? And a lot of the stocks are darn good looking stocks. I'm not, I, don't, I rarely get a, a stinker anymore, I used to, <laughs> When we had a, a wider audience, it would when you used to be able to find a show that have one guy would come every week. I'm gonna stop coming to shows. You never like any of my stocks. It's like, well, start picking better stocks. You know, start picking stocks that trend. He would ask me about the stocks at a straight downtrend, and I'd say, no, it's going down. All right, any more while we're in impasse? 
Well, while we are at impasse, I obviously want to thank everybody for taking time on a busy schedule. I'm humbled by your presence. Looks like we have a new record for most people at night. So that's kind of cool. Invax, let me just check it over here. Yeah, Invax is, this is one that I brought up in the pitch as my pick of the week. And when I followed up on it, it, it failed miserably, okay? And I didn't want to make it sound like in hindsight, I wanted to follow exactly what I said. I said an entry around 150. Personally, I did not take this trade, so I can't say for a fact, but personally, when I eyeballed this chart after the show, a few days after the show, I said, well, it didn't trigger. And when I went back and watched the show and listened to what I said, I was like, oh, well, I guess an entry above 150 would have triggered, okay? And so far, this has failed. And now we have some downside Landry light. And they're just kind of kind of in your mind's eye. Just kind of draw in your inverted kind of saucer or cup and handle look to it. So I think this stock is in the early phases of being in trouble. You want to short that, Chris, or you're looking to buy it? I think there's a lot of other good-looking stocks out there to avoid that one. You're welcome, Barry. Well, we've got the... we got the down under folks i uh i ordered some kookaburros today <laughs> silver kookaburros that is yeah this looks good uh let me pop over here to see what the volume is yeah it's got a pretty good volume uh absolutely now this is an ipo so if there's two ways i would get into this one if it made a new closing high and the lows were greater than the five-day SMA, okay? So new closing high would be up around whatever this bar is here. I'm just eyeballing it. And above the low above the five-day SMA. So we don't have, let's see, one, two, three, four, five. Let's see if it'll plot. By the way, and I wish they didn't do this, just my own personal preference, but I wish they didn't uh, plot the pre price of the IP. I guess it's useful though. Let me show you what I mean by that. Let me just put in a simple moving average. Let's go five days. And let's go thick. And let's get a nice blue. All right. Darken it up a little. Yeah, I'm not as quick with all this as uh, I am some other packages. No, it's not going to show moving average just yet. And that's the whole reason I put that rule in initially was so people who are new to trading IPOs couldn't trade IPOs into that moving average showed up and i think i thought i got that from doug newberry and, and it may have come from somewhere else uh the, the the saying was buy uh an ipo when it crosses above its 200 moving average well i would never wait that long because i think you can miss a lot of great moves in between but that same sort of logic could be used with a shorter term moving average to keep you out of the IPO early on. So yeah, this is this is obviously my IPO list. It's something I'm watching. And if it makes a retracement a little bit deeper, I might consider it as a first deep retracement. But for now, I would treat this as a possible breakout, okay? And if you have one more day, maybe we could even use a Darvish breakout. What the heck, you know? Let's just try this real quick. Yeah, we got time for a couple of more stock picks and we'll go ahead and wrap it up. So if we had one more day, our box would be here. And so a breakout above the box for me to buy again, 29 and the low above the five day EMA, uh, simple moving average, not EMA, simple moving average, which we'll have starting tomorrow. So start watching tomorrow. You're welcome, George. Just looking. All right, what are you looking at, Chris? All right, any more questions? We got time for one or two more real quick and I need to go ahead and wrap things up. Is Kirk is HB too crazy? Yeah, Kirk is uh, Kirk is on the Landry list, but I'm not recommending it as a setup because the HV, you know, you you answered your own question there. And let me just see what the HV is over here on Kirk. 
Um, I think if you're aggressive, it might be worth a shot. I can't stop looking at this silly stock. And it doesn't look as crazy in this package as it does in Telechart, you know. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you're just looking at, if you covered up this scale over here and you just showed me this Landry light and you showed me this pullback to the 30-day EMA, I would be all over this stock, okay? I might be all over it tomorrow. I might just, for shits and giggles, buy a couple hundred shares. Hope I didn't demonetize my video. <laughs> I made it through all the presentation without cursing. And then, oh, just look at an NVAC. Yeah, yeah, just, okay, I got you. Yeah, I got you. Look at an RKT, how? Okay, RKT is going to be a rocket mortgage. So what I would do there is I would now let this pull back a little bit. I did play this one on this day here, and I forget if this is the one. I think this is the one I end, uh, I edit exited half of the shares in after hour trading it's pulled back it needs to pull back a little bit more so yeah i want to pull back i think that'd be great laurent i still like it but i'd like to see it pull back a little bit okay all right i'm gonna go ahead and wrap things up because we're nearly out of time everybody have a fantastic a little bit deeper pullback laurent it's three days but i like to see a little deeper pullback in ipos i know you could be a little bit more lenient and go a little bit less deep but in this particular case, since it's been out for a little while, I'd like to see it pull back a little bit more deeply, maybe shake out a few nervous Nellies, okay? All right, thanks everyone. If we don't talk between now and then, have a great weekend. Everybody stay safe, stay sane, and may the trend be with you. I'll see all you guys. I think most of you guys and girls who are here tonight, I'll see you in the Facebook group, group tomorrow. Everybody else, have a good weekend and hope to see you again next week. Thank you so much.